Thank you, Dr. Onyike and Dr. Dax. That was, that was really interesting. Um, welcome, oh, I'm not Penny, there I am. Um, here, I now have the honor of introducing our event's keynote speaker. Rita Chula is an AFTD board member, director of caregiving at the AARP Public Policy Institute, and a former FTD caregiver for her mom. She's here to talk about her family's FTD journey and to make a call for the empowerment of FTD caregivers, care partners, and persons diagnosed. Please welcome Rita Chula. Good afternoon, FTD family, both here in Baltimore and those across the country attending virtually. After lunch and at the end of the day are tricky places to speak. It could go either way, so stay with me. 30 minutes, I promise. As Angela Taylor mentioned this morning, this conference truly is like a family reunion. While we may not all be related by blood, everyone in this room and attending virtually are united by our shared lived experiences. I see you all and I am so inspired by your stories, by your lives, by your commitment. Before I dive in, I, I want to take a moment to give a huge, huge shout out to the committed staff of AFTD for doing such a truly amazing job of putting this conference together. <laughs> Due to a situation at home, I did most of this virtually for the morning and it was, it was so seamless, so thank you again. Thank you to the AFTD team for giving me the opportunity to speak today. I admit to experiencing every emotion possible today, even though I was virtual for most of it. Am I the only one? What a ride, a ride well worth taking in order to bring about substantive change in this issue for generations to come. I know that we feel we're living in the moment, but what we're doing now truly, truly will have impact. I have an ask. I know it's late in the day, but I have an ask. In this room and virtually, I would like all of us to take a moment. Take a moment and center yourself. Center your thoughts on the reason that you're here today, on the person or persons that brought you here today. As we think about our spouse, our partner, parent, friend, relative, person caring for us, a patient, or even ourselves, I ask that you say their name. This includes those living or who have passed on. There is power in saying their name, calling out their name, remembering their name. In many African traditions, there is a practice of pouring libations while calling out a loved one's name. Today, I invite you to say it out loud in this room or remotely, or if more comfortable, I invite you to say their name in the privacy of your heart. Let's take a moment as a community to say their names. Teresa. Thank you all so much. The amazing poet and advocate, Maya Angelou said, love recognizes no barriers. It jumps hurdles, leaps fences, penetrates walls to arrive at its destination full of hope. Hope is what brings us here together today. Hope is what will bring us through. The name I spoke out loud, Teresa, is my mother. My mom loved music, black gospel music and the Beatles with a little bit of print sprinkled in between. She loved to read books of all kinds. She's probably gonna get me when I let you know that Harlequin romance novels were really my first intro into, you know, 
She also loved to volunteer, especially within the church and with children. Perhaps what I love the most is she was an advocate, a fierce one at that. Give her an issue that she was passionate about and she would fight for it. She would fight for you. My sister and I spent many a summer day on the picket line when her union would be leading a strike to advocate for better working conditions for employees and so much more. Our walk with FTD was more like a never ending marathon. I am sure that so many of you here understand that. Ours began when my mom was 57. One evening, she called me to her room and began weeping. My mom, she was not a crier. She looked at me panicked, desperate, and afraid, and said, I think I'm losing my mind. Something is wrong. Something is off. I don't know what's wrong with me. I was not sure what to do. At the time, I was taking the lead in helping to care for my grandma's needs, more and more, and thought she was just stressed with the current situation. My grandmother passed later that year at 90. It rocked our family as she was the matriarch. I was 33. Over the next few months, I became engaged, started planning my wedding, and thought we were moving to a new place in life when it quickly became apparent that my mom was not the mom we knew. Her mood was shifting, she began to drop out of the activities she so loved. She was short with people, her spending habits went awry, and she just seemed lost. Under our encouragement, she sought out mental health treatment. She moved through a few different therapists, was referred to a psychiatrist, and was ultimately diagnosed with major depression. For much of that time, she lived by herself, which looking back led to isolation that was probably not helpful. I recall her going missing one day, like she was just gone. Her friend called me out of concern and I enlisted folks to drive around to look for her. It was over eight hours and we couldn't find her anywhere. I was a millisecond away from going to the police station and having a silver alert in issued when I did one more drive by in a, a familiar old neighborhood and saw her walking down the street. When I talked to her about it, she said, I'm, I'm out for a walk. I mean, I can go for a walk, can I? After that, my husband and I moved her in with us as living alone or even with a friend was no longer an option. There were more good days than not for her, but clearly there was something going on. After a visit with her psychiatrist, literally left him throwing his hands up and saying, I, I just don't know, I can't think of anything else. Uh, let's try ECT. In that rare shared moment, my mom and I looked at each other, we grabbed our purses, and we got out of there. <laughs> Trust in your provider is critical. And in that moment, we knew he was definitely not the one. The following months enlisted, included enlisting a geriatrician, more psychiatrists, and ultimately a neurologist, who after imaging and an MMI, which I failed when I did it with her, diagnosed her with Alzheimer's. That moment of diagnosis had to be the most surreal experience ever. It went something like this. Your mom has Alzheimer's, here's a pamphlet with more information. The nurse will schedule you for a follow-up in six months. Have a good day. Really? During that time, her faith community, unfortunately, did not surround us in support. Looking back, I realized it was they just didn't know how. Friends no longer called as often as they did. It was a lonely time for all of us. It was not until a good friend and colleague said, Rita, my parents have Alzheimer's, and I don't think that's what your mom has. I was able to get a referral to a neuropsychologist at National Rehabilitation Hospital in Washington, DC. She specialized in working with veterans with traumatic brain injuries. You see, my mom was the victim of a hit and run driver many years before where she was thrown 20 feet. She survived 
but clearly not all the way. All these years and no connection was ever made. No attempt at a connection was ever made. No one asked us our story or our experience to even try to get to that point. Three and a half years later, we received a diagnosis of FTD. Strange to say, but it was a relieving moment. Despite being told that I was being selfish, choosing to have children instead of just focus on your mom, my husband and I, after several years of trying, were blessed with first my daughter and then two years later my son. When I first found out we were pregnant, all I wanted was for my mom to show joy. She couldn't. She just wasn't able to. In fact, it was during my pregnancy that her condition spiraled. After a short stint with my sister, we, were shifted, we shifted mom's care to a small group home. Eventually, my mom's decline and the lack of trained staff in that home led us to place her in a nursing home. Really, the most difficult conversation that I've ever had. I was literally on my knees, I remember this, saying, I am so sorry. I am not giving up. I promise you we are not dropping and leaving you. She understood. She did. I couldn't keep my mom in community. We did not have access to quality, affordable supports. I couldn't pay out of pocket for her care. Qualifying for home and community-based services was great, but didn't mean so much when they told me she was number 3,271 on the waiting list. Her funds were dwindling, and my husband and I had nearly depleted our savings. Our options were limited. We were literally stuck in the middle, as so many in this country are. My mom loved, I'm sorry, I'm moving this too much. My mom loved her grandbabies. Somehow, she was able to find and express that love in ways that let them know how important they were to her. To them, she was their grandmom. They did learn a curse word or two a bit earlier in life, <laughs> but they also learned empathy and patience. Holidays, dance recitals, Dance recitals were one of the hardest. Every child wants their grandmom or granddad to be at ballet. So we had to get creative. We brought ballet to the nursing home. And not only was my mom able to love and delight in the dancing, but so were the other residents of the, of the nursing home, which my kids just saw as bonus grandmas and grandpas. Grandma's room was their room fully equipped with a snack drawer, as every good grandma has, sports on the TV, and a window seat just to hang out on. They learned when they needed to be quiet, how to help or encourage her to eat, and as they grew, even being able to feed her, paint her nails, and so much more. Music and her grandbabies, along with highly specialized care, although it was 40 miles from my home, allowed her to live with dignity. Our goal through this entire journey was to center my mother and allow her to live with dignity, as defined by her in whatever state she was in. She was a person living with dementia. I demanded from all that she be treated always as that person. My family's caregiving journey with my mom ended last October at her bedside. Excuse me, October 2020 at her bedside. Due to COVID visitor restrictions, we had not had physical contact with her for over seven months. I will never FaceTime, look at a window, or a patio door the same way again. We were there for her, but it was not the same. No touch, no smell, no hugs or kisses. We were fortunate to get there at all before she passed away. My sister and I sat with her for almost 10 hours, singing, praying the rosary, telling stories. In that moment, I wanted her to squeeze my hand, give me one more look, but it wasn't to be. 
We told her that she fought the good fight and it was okay to let go, and she did. I often think back to a quiet moment in her room one evening prior to COVID. She was fully aware. We talked about death. We talked about life. I said, Mom, is there anything you want to tell me? And I told her so much. We just didn't know how much more time we had. She said, Rita, you always cross your T's. You always dot your I's. You care for others. I want you to be brave. I want you to be bold. I sat with that in my mind for a few years. Today, that phrase guides me, and I hope it can guide you. As the Director of Caregiving at the AARP Public Policy Institute and a member of the AFTD Board of Directors, I focus on the topic of family caregiving, dementia awareness, support, among other issues every day. However, this issue, as you have heard, is also deeply personal to me. My family's story is just that, it's our story. But it is part of this larger, intricate web of stories that so many of you have shared throughout today. It is part of what makes our FTD community so unique. To you all, you are not alone. You matter. Being bold means knowing the facts and then working to address them, even when it makes us feel uncomfortable. We can no longer ignore the experiences of family caregivers, care partners, and all those providing care. All family caregivers, including those from communities of color who don't fall into an average bucket the caregiving journey of Black, Latino, Asian American, Pacific Islander, and Native American, Alaskan Native peoples is often framed by cultural expectations to care for someone in community. However, with existing structural inequities, bias, and lack of access to quality services and supports in their communities, this expectation comes at a cost to the financial and health-related well-being of the family caregiver and ultimately the entire family. Often we hear, especially as caregivers, put your oxygen mask on first, self-care. I often say, well, what good is reaching for the proverbial oxygen mask to cover your face first if it has holes all over it? Susan spoke in her opening address about the financial strain of living and caring for someone with FTD. When we look at finances across diseases more broadly, we know that caregivers under 40, younger caregivers, as well as black and Latino caregivers often have lower household incomes compared to others, but they spend more money out of pocket. So often when discussing strains family caregivers face, we neglect to look at the physical and emotional toll that that role can play. It is difficult for caregivers from all backgrounds to talk about their own emotional stress associated with the role. This is especially true in communities of color. Increasingly, we see that fewer caregivers say that their overall health is excellent or good. How can you care for someone else when your own health is not good? Many say they find it difficult to take care of your own health. I'll raise my hand and say, I am that person. As mentioned, many caregiving for someone with FTD are often driven from the workforce due to their caregiving responsibilities. This sets up inequities contributing to a generational wealth gap that is hard to close. Being bold is living every day with this disease. I am humbled by the stories of those living with FTD, humbled. I will never forget the experiences shared today, especially of those who are caregiving for others while living with this disease. Being bold 
Some days, it means putting one foot in front of the other or just rolling out of the bed and choosing to make it one more day. Crying in the shower, but pulling it together to work or care or live. Being bold as a health professional, 23% of you are here today or viewing. To continue is to continue the work that many of you are doing in research with clinical trials, with thinking out of the box so that those living with this disease and their families can be diagnosed sooner. This means that we all have to find ways to be more inclusive, inclusive of those across languages, across communities, across incomes, across locations. Health and social service professionals are in a unique position to positively impact the lives of those living with FTD and their families. You must share the needs of these individuals and commit to helping bring about change in the walls of community clinics, hospitals, provider offices, research institutions. It may not be pretty, it may not be cheap, it may not be easy, but it is critical. This community needs your support. Being bold for all of us looks like advocating for those living with FTD with our state, local, and federal legislators when the opportunities present. Things such as caregiver tax credits, more funding for home and community-based services, paid family leave, are just a few things that can lighten the load, if only for a moment. Being bold means telling your story. From the kitchen table, in the school pickup line, those living with FTD are everywhere in community. We are here. We must normalize this lived experience. People must understand and be aware if we expect change. This may be a rare disease by definition, but there is nothing rare about what those in this room and virtually across the country live with every single day. Our children, our grandchildren are watching and they're living it too. Building awareness across all communities is critical. It shouldn't matter if you live in a rural community in Louisiana, an urban neighborhood in New York, if you are from a community of color, if you are wealthy, living paycheck to paycheck, or needing social services. Access to quality health care, access to cutting edge research, access to compassionate, understanding health care professionals should know no barriers. I'm going to share a short, very short video with you. Thank you. My daughter was actually not happy about me sharing this when she heard she was saying tangled and mild, but she's good. <laughs> when I think of the word rare, it is not lacking or less than. It is the diamond hidden in the depths of the earth waiting to be found. It is the four leaf clover hidden yet so sought after. It is my mom and my daughter sharing a sweet moment in song. It is you, it is each of us, it is our community. 
As I close today, I want to share the words of the late Congressman John Lewis. It is only through examining history that you become aware of where you stand in the continuum of change. When Helen Ann Comstock, Comstock started this organization 20 years ago, she knew where she stood. Do you? What one thing can you do after leaving here today to, in the words of my sweet mother, be bold? Thank you. <laughs>